Center of Trinidad and Tobago presents Light in the Word with Bishop Dr. Victor Gill. Today I want to speak to you on the subject. The biggest terror plot. Ezekiel 33, 1 through verse 9. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of, of your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him a watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take heed and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. Praise the Lord. Around 2,500 years ago, God spoke these words to the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. God commanded him, number one, to listen to God, to watch for threats, and to warn the people. And he must warn them in spite of their attitude to his message. And this was an enormous responsibility for the prophet Ezekiel. Because if he saw the sword coming and did not give warning to the people, and they perished, the blood of those that he did not warn will be upon his hand. Today, it is the responsibility of preachers to do the same thing, to warn the people when they see the sword coming. Today, I want to warn you of what I call the biggest terror plot. The biggest terror plot and we know what terror is today we know what terrorism is all about and terrorism is rising in the earth since 911 i am told that there have been approximately 30,000 terror attacks around the world and that every month there are approximately 200 terror attacks worldwide every day there are about 7 terror attacks worldwide and sad to say but true terrorism is actually building momentum worldwide I am told that a recent UK poll shows that there are approximately 1.5 million ISIS followers in the UK and across the Middle East ISIS has an estimated 8.5 million supporters and up to 42 million who view the group positively. And no one knows where the next terror attack will take place. No one knows when the next terror plot will strike. A few days ago, someone posted a video on Facebook with ISIS committing acts of terror. But they advised that the video was too gruesome for viewing and those who decided to watch it should do so at their own discretion. My personal resolve, I've been to desist from posting some of those things posted by ISIS because I considered that Doing so is assisting them in spreading their agenda of fear. And uh, not many people can handle some of these things. But I decided to watch the video that was posted with the advice not to watch it. And if you do, you do so at your own discretion. And indeed, it was horrific. It was savage. It was gruesome. They actually put these men in a cage and lower them and drown them. And they put the camera below the water 
to show the horror. And when they came up from the water, these men were just corpse frothing. It was indeed horrific. And as I said, not many people can stand to see this kind of a terror. According to Fox News and CNN, approximately 22 American veteran soldiers commit suicide every day because of their memory of the acts of terror or the acts of war rather what they experience on the battlefield. And you can Google that and, and find it for yourself. Because I did also. I heard it on Fox News. But I Googled it to verify it. Every day, 22 veteran soldiers, men who have been trained for war, yet because of the impact of what they have seen in battle, they cannot handle it. They take their lives. If many people can't bear the memory of war, if many people cannot bear to briefly look at a terror video or photos, how will they handle a place far worse than any war experience, a place far worse than any terror attack on this earth? How if they cannot bear these things, how will they handle a place that is indeed the biggest terror plot? A place of permanent terror that the Bible speaks profoundly and clearly about. That place in the Bible is called hell. I want to submit to every listener that hell is the biggest terror plot. I observed when the terrorists flew the plane, the, the planes into the World Trade Center. There were people who were caught on the building. And they would rather jump to death than to endure the pain of the heat they were facing. Death to them was a better option than to face the pain. As I said, we cannot watch the pictures. We cannot watch the videos. Men commit, kill, take their own lives on the memory of war. But in the biggest terror plot, the biggest terror plot, there is not even the consolation of death. There's no place to jump from. There's nothing that will give you a temporary relief. I want to tell you today, hell is real. Hell is a reality and hell is a real place. And hell is is the biggest terror plot. And even though the word of God is very emphatic and explicit on the reality of hell, today the subject of hell is becoming less and less popular in pulpits. This itself is a terror plot. Anybody out there? Because the word of God is clear. Some today advocate that it is not love to preach hell. And my question is, is it love not to preach it? If you had advanced knowledge of 911, would it have been love not to warn the people? To not warn the people. The denial of hell or the refusal to preach on the subject is a major mark of end time apostasy. Charles Spurgeon said, there is a deep-seated unbelief among Christians about the eternity of future punishment. Spurgeon
theologian said that this unbelief parades itself as love. But it's not love. He said there is a suspicion that sin is not so bad as we have thought of it after all. And that there is a lurking wish to apologize to sinners. What daylight deception. Years ago, I heard my pastor give a story of a man who got so high on cocaine that apparently he began to hallucinate and he, he, he saw a band saw and he wanted to put his hand on the band so you know that band saw is this electric saw and with, under the influence of the drug something was telling him put your hand on the saw but somehow he was restrained and he did not do it and when he came to himself he realized uh, that there's something wrong with cocaine because under that influence he was about to put his hand on the band saw but I want to say to us today Worse than putting one's hand on the bandsaw is to embrace the thought that hell is probably not so bad after all. That will be not just putting your hand on the bandsaw. And you know what will happen if you put your hand on the bandsaw. But that will be like putting your head on the bandsaw. And forever keeping it there. Because hell is real. We do ourselves an eternal good to think upon the subject of hell in the light that the Bible sheds upon it. Denying hell. Denying that hell is what it is will not make it less real any more than the nine that you have bills to pay at the end of the month will make them less real. Hell is real and the word of God says, says so. I believe what God told Ezekiel 2,500 years ago in Babylon is applicable for us today and is applicable to the preacher today he says son of man when you see the sword coming upon the land your responsibility is to blow the trumpet song the alarm and warn the people then if anyone hears the warning of the trumpet and do not take heed. You have delivered yourself and they will perish in their iniquity and their blood will be upon their own hands. But if you hear the song of the trumpet, if you see the sword rather and you do not blow the trumpet and warn the people, then they will perish. And God says, as a matter of fact, if even one perishes, the blood will I require at your hand. Now I believe this is a responsibility not just to the preacher but for Christians on a whole. Today I want to blow the trumpet again and tell the people and remind us all that there is a sword coming. There is a terror plot of epic proportion. A place where you cannot jump from, you cannot hide from, you cannot run from, you cannot even die from. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, once to die, but after this the judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke about hell that 
plot of terror. And Satan is that terrorist who wants as many souls as possible to go there. Jesus mentioned hell and destruction in 46 verses in the New Testament. According to D.L. Moody, no one ever drew such a pity of hell as the Son of God. He didn't keep back this doctrine of retribution, but preached it openly. Jesus, it is believed, and it is unanimously agreed by theologians that he preached about hell more than he did about heaven. He spoke about the place of outer darkness. He spoke about the place of eternal fire. He spoke about the place of unquenchable fire. He spoke about the place where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. As a matter of fact, he said it would be so horrible that it is better you were not born than to go there. Jesus spoke about hell more than any prophet, any apostle, any disciple in the whole Bible. And bear in mind that Jesus is the final voice to this age. For the Bible says that God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers hath in these last times spoken unto us by his son. Glory be to God. And if Jesus spoke about hell so repetitiously and redundantly it is enough for us to take heed. But Jesus was not the only one who spoke about hell. The Apostle Paul also spoke about hell in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 through verse 9. Paul said, you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed in flaming fires, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished, he said, with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul says uh, those who continue in sin and those who rebel against the gospel and the way of holiness he made no bones to say that they will be punished with an everlasting destruction and this is why I say we need to warn people of the biggest terror plot because if we cannot stand the video, if we cannot stand the memory of war, if we cannot stand the picture, my friend how would we, how would we stand a place where souls will be consigned to forever and ever that Paul calls everlasting destruction but not only did Paul speak about hell also uh, the apostle Peter spoke of hell in 2nd Peter chapter 2 verse 4 through verse 6 he said if God spared not the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but save Noah one of eight people a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemn them to destruction watch this making them an example of those who afterward should live ungodly so hear me today what God did to the angels that sinned by casting them down to hell and what God did by Noah's world by erasing them from the face of the earth and if you read the book of John the time is coming when they will stand before God to be cast into the lake of fire when the Bible says that the sea will give up the dead the world that perished in the flood is yet to face the real judgment But not, not only did Jesus, Paul, and Peter spoke of hell, Jude, the servant of the Lord, also spoke of hell in Jude, chapter, Jude verse 5 and through 7. 5 through 7, he says, But I want to remind you, though 
you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who believe not. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he reserved into everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. My friend, the great day is not, is not what, what the, the day of carnival that people are celebrating this and that. The great day is the day of judgment. And the word goes on to say, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Not only did Jesus, Paul, Peter, and Jude speak of hell, but also the Apostle John spoke of hell. And this is according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through verse 15. And this is said to be the clearest passage in the Bible on the subject of hell. And it says, John said, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open and this is given you know details that many others did not give because he is saying that here is the dead standing the dead the dead the dead when you're dead you are lying down but now he says i see them standing before god and the books were open so it so it shows that god is taking record he said another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they would judge every man according to their works death and hell those people those bodies that death and hell those bodies that are in the graves are going to resurrect people are going to resurrect in their literal bodies and those who their souls in hell will come out of that place where the rich man was and where the bible said the beast and the false prophets are and notice the bible said the sea gave up the dead that's noah's world right there and the bible says and they will judge each according to their works And it goes on to say in verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. So even people who are in hell right now, there's a worse place called the lake of fire. How could we know these things and not tell it? The Bible says this is the second death. And then it says, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. When that day comes, make sure your name is in the book. I want to ask you the question, neighbor, friend, is your name written there? For whosoever was not found written in the book, not, not, it's not which church you went to. It's your name being in the book. For whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Child of God, pause. Slow down. Check 
yourself and reorder your lives under God. For the Lord, according to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world. How I love to preach it. John 3.16 that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is his will that none, none, none perishes. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2 verse 4 and 5. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and in sins. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Glory be to God. The psalmist said in Psalms 86 and verse 15. But you O God are a God of mercy and grace and grace slow to anger and abound, abound, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness oh yes my friend god is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness paul said in romans 8 verse 37 through 39 no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for i am sure that neither death no life, no angels, no rulers, no things present, no things to come, no powers, no heights, no depths, no anything else, no any creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to God. Oh, the song says, oh, the love that drew salvation plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh yes, the years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. I want to tell you, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God has no pleasure in sending anyone to hell. God has no pleasure in one single soul going to hell. I want to tell you today that God has made ample provision for you to make it to heaven. So much more could have been said today, but because of time, I had to stop there. I want to thank all of you that have tuned in from across the Caribbean. You have listened to this message today and probably God has spoken to your heart. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. I also want you to know that there's a heaven and there's a hell. And the big question is, where would you spend eternity? If you're not saved, I want to pray for you. Say this prayer with me from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. I believe you died for me. You rose again from the dead. And today I invite you into my heart as my Savior and as my Lord. Thank you for hearing this prayer, for coming into my life and for saving my soul. Give me the strength to serve you until I see you face to face. If you said that prayer, I want you to know God heard you. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. What you need to do now is get into a good Bible-believing church where you can be nurtured in the word of God and be prepared for water baptism. Again, I want to thank you for viewing Light in the Word. You want to contact us, you can call the number on the screen or you can contact me on Facebook, Bishop Victor Gill, and let us be friends. Keep viewing Mercy and Truth Television. God bless you.